Thank you very much. Uh, so first, it's a great honor to come and speak to you here. Uh, it's been really an amazing few days, uh, and I've really learned a tremendous amount. So I really enjoy the appreci or appreciate the opportunity to come and tell you about our work. So the story I want to tell you about today um, is starts out as an older story, um, where for a number of years, people have uh, observed that HIV can traffic along microtubules. Um, and I show uh, images of this paper here from uh, Dave McDonald when he was in the HOPE lab, um, where he did some uh, correlative EM to observe viral capsids uh, trafficking along microtubules. And many other labs have uh, observed that there is a microtubule dependent um, aspect of infection. Our co-chair, uh, while she was in uh, Pierre Charnot's lab, has observed similar things. And we have also recently observed, as well as the Berthel lab, that uh, disrupting dynein-mediated trafficking towards the nucleus during infection can perturb the process of uncoding, whereby the viral core disassembles during infection to uh, promote infection. And so one question that hasn't been answered is really, what is the nature of this bridging molecule right here um, that you can see uh, connecting the capsid to the microtubule? And so the story I'm going to tell you about today pertains to that and involves a protein called bicotyl D2. Um, and so um, in the microtubule literature, uh, bicotyl D2 is what is known as a microtubule adapter protein. And so what it does is it has a cargo binding domain as well as a dynein dynactin uh, complex binding domain. And the way these adapters work is that normally dynein is not very processive. And by, um, binding, the car by binding specific cargos, what that does is it allows dynein to access this dynein uh, binding domain. And by, by binding these adapters, this actually increases or activates the processivity of the dynein motor, such that this couples then cargo binding by an adapter to uh, processivity on a microtubule. And so the reason that we were originally interested in this uh, protein is it was picked up in one of the three uh, genome-wide screens for HIV-associated factors. And so obviously the track record of molecules that were picked up in one of the screens but not the other two is not that great. So we decided to confirm that result using uh, CRISPR-Cas depletion, both in the cell line model that was used in the original screen as well as THP1s, which we use as, which we differentiate into macrophages and use as a monocyte model. So what you can see here is that we generated two guide RNAs to bicotyl D2 that efficiently knock down the protein um, in both cell types. And additionally, using two different guide RNAs to different targets alleviates the concern of uh, nonspecific effects of our uh, guide RNAs in the CRISPR-Cas system. And so what we observed, um, similar to the uh, one genome-wide screen, is that when we um, knock down uh, bicotyl D2, we observe that uh, infection by HIV pseudotype with either an X4 or R5 tropic envelope is decreased. And more importantly, this occurs in THP1 differentiated macrophages. So then we sought to map this uh, block to infection that was being induced by bicotyl D2. And so uh, just like the last speaker, what we first utilized was uh, the BLAM VPR fusion assay. This relies on um, beta-lactamase VPR that is incorporated into the viral core, uh, which then uh, when a fusion occurs, will cleave a fluorescent substrate that's been loaded into the target cell, which relieves a FRET reaction. And you can observe this fusion then as a shift in the fluorescence of these target cells. And what you can see here, uh, unlike the previous speaker who had uh, really interesting data, we observed that really bicotyl D2 depletion did not uh, relieve uh, this, uh, or we saw no difference in the amount of fusion when we knocked down uh, bicotyl D2. We similarly saw no defect in reverse transcription. So in both cell line models, uh, we observed that uh, uh, bicotyl D2 did not inhibit reverse transcription in the target cells when we looked at uh, late, uh, products, uh, late products of reverse transcription. However, if we measured uh, nuclear import, which we can measure through 2LTR circle formation, now we could observe a defect uh, in the nuclear import uh, of the virus in these uh, cells lacking bicotyl D2. So um, a number of 
you know, perhaps non-specific effects can lead to the results that I've just shown you. And so to really convince ourselves and hopefully you that bicaudal D2 is the dining cargo adapter for HIV, we wanted to answer two questions. Number one is, does bicaudal D2 specifically and directly interact with the HIV capsid? And uh, is bicaudal D2 required for viral trafficking in the target cell? And so uh, to answer the first question, uh, we relied on some assistance from our collaborator, Felipe diaz Grafero, who utilized a series of different bicaudal constructs to examine their ability to uh, interact with um, HIV capsid. And so what you can see here is what, what this assay involves is you spin down um, assembled capsid uh, to the bottom of a centrifuge tube, and you look to see if this assembled capsid will pull down uh, your molecule of interest. And what he observed was that uh, full-length bicaudal D2 um, indeed came down uh, uh, with when capsids were present, uh, when he added capsids to the cell lysates. And similarly, if he just used uh, the coiled coil 2 and 3 domain, he observed uh, that this also came down with the capsid. So to understand which of these two domains uh, were responsible for this binding, he individually looked at um, the, the coiled coil 2 and the coiled coil 3 domain. He detected no binding of the coiled coil 2 domain, but he can see, again, the, the coiled coil 3 domain, which other studies have shown is the cargo adapting domain or the, the domain of bicaudal D2 that binds cargo, did come down with capsid. You can see it as a band here just below P24. <clears throat> so next we looked to see if we could observe a defect in trafficking uh, when we knocked out uh, bicaudal D2. And so uh, I had some movies that uh, weren't playing, but I can show you the end result of those movies, which we can do is we can generate traces of individual viral particles. And I would say that first, we've gated our analysis here um, on cytoplasmic viral particles through the use of an S15 membrane label. This will come up uh, in the next slide. Uh, but here, what we're looking at is viruses that have fused and have therefore lost their S15 membrane label. So we're, we're effectively gating on viruses that have entered the cytoplasm that would be able to traffic independently of being in a vesicle. And what you can see is that the traces we observe in the course of a 10 or a 15 minute movie in the wild type cells are uh, visibly just longer um, than the traces that we observe in these bicaudal D2 knockout cells. We can put numbers on that. <clears throat> so if we looked, in, what's also very nice is we can compare fused and unfused populations of viral particles, and we can measure their displacement or their speed. And what you can see is that uh, in the BICT2 knockout cells, the fused viral particles have a profound defect in displacement and speed. And as a very nice internal control, we can look to see the trafficking patterns of unfused viral particles that are in a vesicle that retain this membrane label. And what you can see is that um, while in uh, endosomes or lysosomes, these uh, viruses are traveling in vesicles that are apparently in independent of BICT2 depletion because they show no differences uh, in these parameters. So finally, what we can do is if you want to really demonstrate microtubule mediated trafficking, you can do what's called a mean square displacement analysis. And so mean square displacement is able to separate trafficking patterns from directed motions, which form a parabolic uh, pattern uh, on the, a graph uh, like such as this, from normal diffusion or confined diffusion. And so what we can do is measure the trafficking patterns of really, I think we did hundreds of particles, and looked to see does bicaudal D2 uh, decrease the ability of viral particles to undergo uh, directed motion. And in fact, that's what we observed. We can uh, observe a pattern consistent with directed motion in the majority of viral particles in a wild type cell, but when we knock out bicaudal D2, we can see that this pattern of uh, directed motion is substantially decreased. So one of the other things that my lab is very interested in is how um, viruses can be sensed um, by the host cell, and um, under normal circumstances, although with some sub-exceptions and deference to some of the people in the audience, um, there's not a tremendous amount of sensing of viral particles during infection. And so we asked, if we prevent the viral trafficking by bicaudal D2 depletion, can we make the virus more susceptible to sensing mechanisms uh, in uh, macrophages? <clears throat> and what you can see here is that the answer uh, seems to be yes. So if we compare control cells to bicaudal D2 depleted cells with either of our guide RNAs, 
we can see uh, substantial upregulation of um, interferon dependent genes uh, or ISGs upon viral infection. And so what this tells us is if we can, if we can interrupt or disrupt the interaction between capsid and microtubule adapters like bicaudal D2, we can now leave the virus prone to sensing mechanisms that might uh, not otherwise be engaged. <clears throat> So just to briefly summarize uh, what I told you in cartoon form, what I've shown you is that uh, the viral capsid um, in the cytoplasm can engage this bicaudal D2 uh, dynein adapter through the cargo binding domain or the coiled coil 3 domain. And when we disrupt that interaction, we disrupt what is normally effective dynein dependent trafficking, which we can measure as uh, directed motion uh, in these cells. Um, and Additionally, by disrupting this interaction, we prevent the nuclear import of the viral genome. But I think more excitingly, what we can do is we can increase the sensing of these viruses in the host cell, such that you can imagine if you're looking to leverage an interferon-mediated inhibition of viral infection, this would be a mechanism by which uh, to do that. So uh, I will just acknowledge the people that did the work. Uh, Adar Daran is a very talented postdoc in my lab, and he was assisted uh, by Omar Abdel Rahim, who is a new student in the lab who uh, provided some of the innate sensing data. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>Yeah, we're, we're working on that right now, and the degree to which I'm certain is I'm not willing to say it here. Nathalie, you have a question? Are we seeing the virions or clusters of virions? So our work doesn't directly address that. I tend to think that once fused into the cytoplasm, we're looking at individual viral complexes, but I think to do that, you'd have to look at individual electron micrographs. Um, previous work has shown that those seem to be individual viral particles, uh, both from the HOPE lab and from Natalie, but we have not done that. I just have a question. I, I was, sorry, I was just wondering, uh, do you know what is being sensed? Like, you didn't mention, is it no, protein, I didn't. nucleic acid? Um, we're doing those experiments right now, so I think the question is, is it, say, the viral genome being sensed, or is it the capsid that's now <laughs> sensed? I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't know, or you don't say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, was there another question on the phone? Um, do you have any evidence that this happens in farm cells? Uh, is bipolar expressed in animal T cells? So we, we don't have this result in T cells yet. We've had trouble getting the CRISPRs to work in primary cells, but that's, also, that's something we're doing right now to confirm that we see that. I think. THP1s, the degree to which they can be differentiated, are pretty close to a macrophage, but obviously we want to show it in primary cells. And you get, you see the, uh, the expression of this protein in primary cells? Sure. So definitely in macrophages we see the protein. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very uh, interesting work. Uh, we 